Live from Western Kentucky University, capital of the Hilltopper Nation. Whether it's in the locker room or on the field, behind the clipboard or on the court, home or away, we've got you covered. Get ready to enter the Red Zone, your destination for all things sports, right here on Revolution 91.7. Hello, WKU fans, Anyone else here? Fans of sports. Sports fans good college progressive music. I'm glad that you on. Fletcher Keel here with you, uh, riding this ship of the Red Zone. Welcome in. Not sure how exactly you enter an actual Red Zone. Maybe the, you got to get inside the 20. Maybe the Definitely. eatery on campus. Maybe the 20 in the football field. Do you think it's hot in the Red Zone? It's the, reds, it's the reds. money zone. That's the green zone, is yeah, what the NFL usually, players call it. Red is usually associated with heat. Passion. I'm t- passion. Passion as well. But I am taking an astronomy class this semester, and it's actually the red stars that are the cooler ones and the blue stars that are the hotter ones. Astronomy so, astronomy lessons with Fletcher Keel exactly. here on the Red Zone. You never know what you're going to get when you listen to the Red Zone <laughs> here on Revolution 91.7. I've talked enough. Fletcher Keel. With me tonight, Will Puckett. It's been a while since you've been this is the Air first year. Where have you been? semester. And Mr. Billy Rutledge, who's here every week, you you know the voice. Yeah, it's getting annoying at this point, I'm sure. You can follow all of us on Twitter, at Fletch Topper, at Pucko9, that's the number nine, and at Billy R Sports. Also follow the show, at WKU Red Zone. And a part of that, you can send us questions, comments, concerns, pleads to get off the air and return uh, to normal conversations or, or bring back Josh Holland. We can bring start back a movement, Josh. hashtag bring back Josh Holland. Uh, any questions or concerns, uh, comments that you have throughout the show tonight, tweet us at WKU Red Zone. And who knows, it might just get read on air and your question might be answered. Be comment, famous. Your comment might become a part of the conversation and you might become just semi, se- semi-famous. Not 15 minutes, more like 15 Or it just shows seconds. you have nothing better to do on a Wednesday night than listen to that's us. That's true. Whoa. That's true. Plenty, <laughs> plenty to do tonight in terms of topics. Going to talk some WKU, some national topics. But first off... Not breaking news necessarily, fellas, but some news that I believe has been confirmed, not by WKU, but by other sources. Uh, I think it was last week, if not last week, the week before last, uh, it was reported by the Daily News that DJ Clayton, freshman guard, requested a release of his scholarship from the Hill after just one season. And then over the weekend, I saw from verbalcommits.com that it says that Clayton has officially transferred. Now, WKU and the the wonderful Michael Schroeder, the SID uh, direct information director over there, and WKU will not release a statement until the semester comes to an end. So we won't know a whole lot officially until that point. But if this is true, that's got to be a huge blow to what was already looking to be a not-so-stellar 2015-2016 year. Yeah, huge blow. He was expected to play major minutes this upcoming season, and he was kind of looked on as the first, second guy off the bench this season. Mm-hmm. So T.J. Price, Trency Jackson are, were really the two backbones in the guard position, and they're both seniors graduating, gone now. So what does that leave? That leaves who? Brandon Price, Avery Patterson, and Chris, Chris Harrison Dox, who just got cited for possession of marijuana That's the other the day. That's the third or fourth Hilltopper to do that, a, a crazy scenario there as well. Uh, a little bit blown blown up and, or blown out of proportion in my eyes, but that's a different conversation for a different day. It, the Hilltoppers do have three commits coming in, three highly touted commits, especially uh, I believe it's Frederick Edmondson, yep. Frederick Edmonds, Juco, uh, transfer. Juco transfer, who's been talking about WKU for years. So, so, so power coming in, but the danger here is we don't know what the tops are going to get with those three commits come 2015, 2016, and we do know what the Hilltoppers have in DJ Clayton, who at times this year, and especially in a game like the Louisville game against a, a top tier opponent, looked pretty special. Looked like he could be something a lot of fun to watch on the Hill, and sadly, it's starting to look like we won't have that opportunity. I mean, Clayton was a big impact on this team, and they. I mean, you had Fant, you had Price, and you had you had all these pieces, but really, DJ Clayton was the freshman that you could almost look up that you looked for next to Justin Johnson. But he was the other one who came in, and you looked for him to make an impact. And missing him, especially losing the t- the three players that were losing, this is going to be a spot that they have to fill. And you're just kind of wondering, like, where's it going to come from? I remember tweeting during DJ Clayton's. He had career high 15 points, and it was in the all in the first half of, I'm trying to think, believe who it was, but it was all 15 points in the first half, mm-hmm. and I tweeted at that game that DJ Clayton could be the next TJ Price of WKU. Oh, absolutely. He had all the intangibles, and if he could have been coached by Harper for four years, just like Fant and Price were, he could have been the next face 
of WKU basketball. Absolutely. If anyone out there, even if you guys share my thought process, I was thinking DJ Clayton and Justin Johnson will be the next in line to George Fant and TJ Price. Very comparable players. Just so, that just so happens they play the same positions, but they could have been as as a, as huge of a tandem as Price and Fant were. Now this is the third guard to leave the program since this past season started. We all know about Ian Day well. We all know about the problems that were caused there. The Hilltoppers lose him, and then they begin to win. And then Kevin Kaspar, who was going to leave at the end of the season and opted to leave before the first semester ended for professional reasons overseas. So can't really blame him for that. But it, it always seems there's a, a couple of surprising guys. Uh, to leave the program since Ray Harper's taken over, and that leads me to wonder, is it really that difficult to play under Ray Harper, or is this just where college basketball is, and especially mid-major college basketball, always looking for a bigger opportunity? I don't think it's really that hard. I think just Harper's approach is something that maybe collegiate kids that are, think they're going to star right out of high school, it isn't, you know, that's not what their forte is. I think Harper has a kind of like... He, he always says at the press conferences, he doesn't set the lineup. He, he doesn't know who, who's going to play when. It's just kind of how the game goes, how he feels goes. So, you know, I don't, I don't think a lot of high school kids coming out of, or coming out of high school like that. And I think they want some stabil, stability and they mm-hmm. want to be on the starting five and know that their coach has their back. And Harper kind of plays it a different way. And it's been successful. And that's the thing. He has a few guards leave, but he had, just had his third 20 straight win season. Yep. So, and that's something that's never been done. John Oldham, EA Diddle, they didn't do that. And, and in following that train, that train of thought, you want some consistency in the mindset of a guy like DJ Clayton. How much more consistent does it get knowing that two of the guards in the starting lineup are gone and knowing that you were essentially penciled in? That also leads me to think maybe he knows something about the incoming class that we don't quite yet. And we, we don't we know, know what they could be, but maybe DJ Clayton knows what the coaching staff's intentions are, and maybe he he doesn't see a future here uh, with those new guys coming. We in. also don't know if anybody else is going to leave. You know, there's you know some always rumblings and rumors of people that are going to leave the program again. So WKU could be t- t- taking another hit. I know they're bringing in what two or three players, mm-hmm. but. It could be even worse. And one of those rumors is uh, I heard people say, well, if DJ Clayton leaves, Justin Johnson might leave as well, which I have a much more difficult time believing. One, he's a Kentucky kid. Two, Coach Boyden has said uh, before that he and, and Harper and the program have started recruiting him since his 10th grade year. And that you don't just get recruited for that long, come here, and then after a year of playing behind a guy like George Fan, if you're Justin Johnson, just say, yeah, I think I'll go go test the waters elsewhere. It, it seemed when he came in that Justin Johnson was all in on WKU, and if it is the case that he'll leave with, with Clayton, that's an even huger blow. I, I completely agree. I think that if, if we're sitting here saying, well, we've lost a guard, DJ Clayton's gone, what can you – I think – Guards can almost always come out of the waterworks. You can have a mediocre guard come in and get him a little bit of playing time and get him some practice time, and out of nowhere he can come in and step up and make some shots and make some plays in the game. I think it's way more important to have an established big man in Justin Johnson, and for him to leave this WKU team, I'd rank him at the very bottom of Conference USA if he were to leave. I, think- I mean, I know they're already ranked there now, but still, if he were to leave, this team is in full I mean, almost Braves mode, rebuild mode. I think Johnson bleeds Hilltopper red, though. I think yep. he really bonded with George Fant over mm-hmm. the season. I think really that it's kind of going to become his team a little bit, and more and more he grows up, matures, and plays even more. I mean, I just saw him today walking to the studio tonight. He's running with his shirt off. He's got his Ray-Ban sunglasses on, and, boy, he's, is he tatted up. Have you seen the chest piece that he has? <laughs> I haven't. He has got some sick tattoos, Hopefully as, he can the kids stay, say it. Hopefully he can stay around long enough for us to see it yeah. <laughs> next year. But he is a, he definitely does. He's going to start to have to embody WKU basketball. I mean, maybe, the, maybe that's what Harper – I, it's hard to say as, you, as, as deep as college sports are, you can't really find somebody who's going to bleed your school colors. But maybe as a mid-major and where WKU is at right now, the tops need to go out and look for people who are more built like Justin Johnson, who want to play for WKU, who want to bleed Hilltopper Red. And I think if you get – that's easier said than done, certainly. Yeah, a lot, but if very you hard. Find, but if you find people who want to do that and have the same aspirations who just aren't here for maybe if I play a really good couple of seasons, I can make it to D-League and then maybe get into the NBA – and maybe that's what DJ Clayton was thinking.
thinking, but if we find more people who, or if they find more people who act like Justin Johnson, maybe we're not speaking of this in four years. It is kind of the growing pains of being a mid-level college basketball mm-hmm. school. Yep. I think DJ Clayton kind of saw it as a stepping stone, maybe. That we saw, he saw some flashes, a very good play. You know, he had a few times where he didn't play very well. Mm-hmm. But, but uh, he, again, as a freshman, right, exactly. A bit expected. And so uh, I think that maybe somebody watches a few basketball games and sees that talent, and maybe somebody whispers in DJ Clayton's ear and says, "Hey, you want to come play for uh, a little bit bigger school and get a little bit more playing time, a little bit more exposure?" One thing Ray Harper does very well is gets transfers to transfer into WKU. Justin Johnson, seemingly now one of the the rare players that WKU has, got, or has gotten from the high school level. Coach Harper's experience in junior college and just how well known he is in basketball circles. Uh, even a guy like Trincy Jackson, Chris Harrison, Docks both transferred in from Texas Tech and Butler, and and that almost kind of makes your argument a bit stronger. Will they've already been somewhere they knew what they were looking for, and then once Harper comes knocking on the door, okay, this is the place I want to be. And luckily, Chris Harrison Docks has no in- or shown no inklings of wanting to leave, and hopefully that remains for a couple more yeah, years. Yeah, Will talks about the WKU being at the bottom of the conference if Justin Johnson left, if Chris Harrison Docks left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't talk- even want to think about you're that. You're talking what? Hopefully not single digit wins. You're, you're talking maybe you're, a little more you're than You're talking that? Hilltoppers might not be in the conference tournament. Yeah, next exactly. Year. All, all but two teams don't make it, or all but two teams make it, and the Hilltoppers would be f- flirting with that not make it line. It, it, you guys weren't here for this, but when I when I think of DJ Clayton leaving, and those who are listening who who remember this on Twitter can tweet in with their thoughts on it at WKU Red Zone. Is if DJ Clayton does leave again, not nothing official, just rumblings. It almost reminds me of the Derek Gordon situation my freshman year in 2011, and I would even rank this as a bigger loss than Derek Gordon was. Gordon came in, was Mr. Hilltopper number five, played with a lot of energy, didn't put up necessarily the numbers that you would have thought that he would with his energy on the court, but still loved to be here, and then out of the blue, transfers up to UMass, is from the Northeast, Clayton out from California. But here's the thing with Clayton. Sure, he doesn't necessarily have the talent that we we think that Gordon would have had had he stayed four years here, but that's the danger of it. We we still had or the D- Hilltopper still had Chris H- or T.J. Price and George Fant and all those guys in the wing. With with Clayton leaving, he could have been this great talent, and now we just don't know. And and with Gordon, we we knew what the tops had at the time. And the, uh, again, the danger here is if D.J. does go. We're sitting here joking about how the Hilltoppers might not be making the tournament next year. Yeah, I was just about to say, make that point is that it was kind of like. You were losing something, but you were almost okay with it. You know, when he left, it was kind of like, okay, well, we still have a very talented team, talented players. It's just a very big piece of the puzzle missing. But now DJ Clayton leaving, this is, this is pretty big. I mean, this is kind of future teams, future leaders. You know, you got to think that he was going to be the captain of this team. I mean, not, maybe not necessarily next year. I'm just somewhere in the future. But I mean, the, the blow to this, I feel is a a little bit more than, um, Gordon. Well, only in Kentucky can you talk nearly 15 minutes of basketball when it's not basketball season, which it officially is not. We'll touch on that later. Of course, talk some Final Four and some NCAA tournament. We're going to take our uh, – maybe. If, if Billy's lucky, we'll talk some I got Masters. The, I got there. the hat on. You can't, yeah. you can't you not talk the hat about it. I see you went to go uh, – you decided to go forward. Yeah, well, you know, I may I may after the commercial break flip it backwards. Just All right, how well, I'm feeling. let's take that commercial break, see what Billy does with his hat. You're listening to The Red Zone right here on Revolution 91.7. Keeping you up to date on Western Kentucky sports, you're in the red zone right here on Revolution 91.7. Welcome back to the red zone here on Revolution 91.7. Fletcher Keel, Billy Rutledge, Will Puckett, not necessarily in that order. And balloons, you think balloons, you think springtime and there, nothing signifies spring here on the hill than Big Red riding a bicycle. I saw him. I saw that He today. was coasting. Yeah, I think he was a little late getting to the softball <laughs> complex and had to had to take other forms of transportation, give him a fist bump on the way. Uh, always good to see Big Red wherever you are. I had a, my uh, RA freshman year said uh, every time he sees Big Red, he took a selfie with him, which I thought was awesome. I, I always think of that, but I never do. I would have a, a ton of selfies. You know there's there. a scholarship? You go to school for free here if you're Big Red. If oh. you're one of the people that actually, I don't know if it's complete tuition and board, but yeah. it, there's significant money that you get for being able to dress well, up like one of the most beloved mascots. For Big Red a couple of years ago then. Yeah, def. I mean, I'll be right back. <laughs> can you can you jiggle like Big Red? Fletcher? So not naturally, but I'm sure I'm sure if I had 
had the size of Big Red, I could I could do a pretty good job. So Big Red moseying on down to softball earlier today, and as he does, he passed LT Smith Stadium where football practice is going on, the spring game next week, and a guy that I hear the name a whole lot of, whether it be from Jeff Brom or Nick Holt Sr. or even Mr. Rutledge or uh, Mr. Josh Holland, John Tavius Morse, the UAB transfer, and apparently before practice even started, we heard rumblings that he was already making a presence with teammates in the locker room. And, and come the start of uh, spring camp, he's been making a, quite a impression on the field as well. Yeah, and uh, they're going to be able to come in and immediately start. And that's something that WKU needs, especially in a season where the offense was so good, but the defense was kind of under par. And so he's going to be able to come in with a few other UAB players we were hearing rumblings about, but they're going to be able to come in and immediately make the defense better, which is what WKU wants because they're in contention mode right now. They only got one more season left to Dowdy in them. At the back half of the season, relatively speaking, because the defense was not, I mean, the defense was bad. It wasn't terrible. It was bad. It was bad. It, it was, was it was really I, you you could almost say terrible, but it was really bad. And the reason I almost say the entire reason why this defense wasn't that good is because they could never get pressure at the line of scrimmage. They could never get they can never pressure the quarterback. They can never get pressure up front. Morris is going to change this because when you have one guy who can pressure the ball, you're going to have guys who want to keep their spot and they're going to start pressuring the quarterback as well. And if you produce on the front half, that opens the back half of the defense, which we know can produce. I mean, they're getting wonderful Terry back. The rest of it still a little bit remains to be seen, but pressure on the front half results to winning battles on the back. And the half. defensive line, all four starters are coming back. And Gavin Rocker really had a good end of the year. Mm-hmm. He's going to be the the, the, entire the number one defensive outside of that end. Marshall game had a pretty good end of the year with Army, UTEP, and, and UTSA. Right. And outside of the CMU and, game too. Well, that was the second that. half that was of the game. <laughs> but yeah, the defensive line is really going to be what starts up front for Western. If they can get pressure, you don't have to have the best defensive backs. If you can get a, a hurried quarterback, a hit on the quarterback here and there, you're going to get gooses. You're going to get bad passes, and that's what makes okay defenses look good. And that's what the next level that the Hilltopper defense has to make. This segues perfectly into John Tavis Morse to the defense. This defense can't be as bad as it was in 2014 again, can it? Is it possible? I, I don't know. I mean, it was, I don't know. It, it was, was pretty bad. bad. It was bad at times. I think the run defense was was adequate. And you can I think you can say that is that while we're while we're knocking the up front the pass pressure of the off of the defensive line, they were good in run support. Their defensive, their well, pass defense they were adequate. Okay. But I, their I, pass I, defense has to I mean, where come on. I feel like it was very one I feel like at times the pass defense was actually there and then that's when they just abandoned the run defense and so it was very one dimensional at any given moment. If you were stopping the pass, you knew a run was gonna come. If they were stopping the run, you knew that it was gonna be a field day on the field for the opposing quarterback. We actually have a Twitter question. Tweet us with your questions or comments at WK Red Zone from one of our pals, uh Will and I know him pretty well, Josh Harris at Josh Harris nineteen says the defensive backs struggled a lot last year. Are we expecting any younger guys to sk- step up this year, or is Brom happy with the current group? And kind of what you guys were talking about with uh, with the defensive line returning and, and doing a bit better, but the rest of the defense is, is still kind of a question mark. Yeah, I'm not really sure. You know, it's kind of pretty early for that. A lot of people are getting a lot of looks right now. Spring's kind of a time for experimentation, kind of see which guys are mixing and matching. But, you know, one thing about wonderful Terry is that he always made the big plays, but he had to give up a few plays for him to finally get that interception for a touchdown. He had to get beat a few times before he was actually got the touchdown or a big player pass deflection. And I hope that he really improves and kind of makes that next step. Kind of maybe comes a Cam Clemens in that kind of situation. Maybe he can make that next step. But or Cam Thomas. Thomas, excuse me. There you go. And, Be uh, interesting if you came Cam yeah, Clemens. Cam Clemens. <laughs> do it being anywhere DB. on the field. Hey, he, he could have tried the way he's, that DB he's played a little last small. year. True. He's a little small, but that athletic system, man, I wouldn't put it past him. But uh, I definitely think that wonderful Terry needs to make that next step. I mean, you never want – every time we – we sit here and talk about wonderful Terry, how wonderful he was, no pun intended, honestly. Puns pun are always intended. No pun intended, pun zone. intended. But how we, we don't talk, we talk only about the positive plays that he made, the interceptions and all that. And like uh, Billy said, is he'd make three or four mistakes and then he'd make the one perfect play and it just all of, all, it seems a bit yeah. forgiven. But he, 
I don't want to see that out of him. With his senior leadership and him being the main, taking over Cam Thomas's spot on defense, being the main guy to go to, while he might not seem like the leader off the field, he's got to be that leader on the field. And for the young guys, I mean, this signing class this year was, was weak in respect to the defensive back class. But for the guys who came in in the last class, in the 2014 class and not the 2015, he's got to show them what it means to start playing better ball and not sunbelt ball. Yeah. And, and the defense as a whole last year was really very young. And so to, we kind of saw with the progression of the defense got better, especially those last three home games. It was more so not, oh, things are finally clicking in the sense that finally they have it together. It was, this is a young defense. We have to be patient with it. And we finally saw the rewards of that. Now, from the defense to the offense here a little bit, the receivers are probably going to be the, sh- the story again this year with Brandon Dowdy back for a six year. We all know the threat that he is. And aside from losing Willie McNeil, and I believe one other receiver who, whose name is, uh, is escaping me right now. Taiwan Taylor. Taiwan Taylor. No, you know, he's still on, isn't he? No, I, I believe so. Who are they losing? It's um, Willie McNeil. It's McNeil and, and someone else. We'll, we'll look it up in our break. I'll look now, it up right now, now we all feel silly. Uh, but the receivers are coming back, hearing great things about Nicarius Fant. Joel German. Joel German, thank you. Uh, Taiwan Taylor's still still here. Just pick pick a name. And, and, they're, and they're coming back. And how how big of a year are the receiving court going to have, do you think? Dangerfield, Antoine Grant, and Taiwan Taylor combined for over 2,000 yards and 24 touchdowns last year. They're, they're good. They're pretty good, and they know what they're doing. They're in the, another year in this system, and Brandon Dowdy coming back, I mean, it's going to be a strength. I talked to Coach Shepard, the wide receiver coach, the other day, and he says he expects greatness this year. They all do. Yep. And you know who's been standing out so far is Nicarius Fant. Yeah, and he's been the talk been of the spring this this year, and he has really stepped up his game. I can see him being really three, four re- number receiver right there. He won Mr. Football in 2013, and he is going to break out for Western. In in this offense, you need depth at the wide receiver position, so the he's going to get Bowling some Green, time. Bowling Green, Golden Boy, in yeah, the Fant, BGHS standout, Mr. Fant, and he's <clears throat> he's apparently getting reps. I've seen in the kick return game. <clears throat> We we saw freshmen step up last year, so That's it's exciting. not it's not yeah, out of the question there. that Fant could could become that that third or fourth receiver. And he if he is as as good as the coaches and what we're hearing is making him out to be, he could truly be the next game changer. Just moving along in the wings of of Brandon Dowdy and, and Antonio Andrews and Bobby Rainey, and and that's a good thing because WKU really hasn't had. Uh, a a guy from the sl- or f- not in the backfield, uh, that being a running back or quarterback, be that kind of impact player. And Akarius Fant could be really the first one for WKU to get it done in all a- assets of the offense. Yeah, Fant, a sophomore now. I talked to him the other day. We were just talking to the receivers, receiver coach. And he was saying that he learned a lot last year, especially from McNeil and Joel German. Those seniors really taught him a, a lot. And he didn't get a lot of playing time. I don't believe he was redshirted, so he had, did have the opportunity to play. But I think it was perfect for him. He came out with Mr. Football, maybe a little high expectations, but he was he didn't get to play, and I think that really humbled him a little bit. And I think that now that he's gonna he's gonna be able to learn. You, you talk about the NFL or an NFL analogy here. Quarterbacks are just expected to be good. They're no longer you can just wait on a quarterback to Marcus learn. Marcus Mariota, Jameis Winston. Exactly. They have to be good right now. They can't wait two or three years like Aaron Rodgers, four or five, whatever. And I think that really helped Fant. And I think another year in the system, you're just going to see the results skyrocket. I mean, I think the person that he, obviously he's not going to be coming in, he's not going to be here this season, but the person that he probably learned the most from was Willie McNeil. Mm -hmm. Because when we're talking... They play a lot alike. When we're talking bodies, they're almost built the exact same. McNeil maybe has an inch or two on Fant, but Fant's Fant's a slot. He's a Wes Welker build, Danny Amendola sort of skinny, fast, and that's who he's going to be. But I... I watched him at Bowling Green a couple times, and he was I, he was too small for the college game. And I think that has a lot of reason why he didn't get many reps his freshman year. But a, a, what I'd say probably a year and a half in the weight program here at WKU, he's bulked up. I've seen him on campus, and he's a lot bigger than he was coming in as a freshman. And having added size in the slot game and still the speed that he can show, I think that he can be a standout. And I think that he's going to open the game up still for Dangerfield to get catches and everybody else. But, I mean, I expect big things from Fant, and that's what we're talking about right now is that he has the ability, and with the added size he got, I think he can be, I you say a four, I think he could be a two or a three receiver Even on this, this year? You still yeah. think he could be a two? You got Jared Dangerfield, Antoine th- Grant, yeah. and Tywan Taylor? I don't think a, a two is feasible for this year unless 
heaven forbid there's an injury or yeah, he's he a just torn ACL Im- away from it too, or, right? Or he just impresses the you know what out of all of us in the first couple of games. But I don't I don't see that happening, especially with the returning receivers. But I I, I think his ceiling could ultimately oh, be a two. Definitely. And Brom said the other day about Fant, there's not a ball that is thrown up in the air that they don't think that he can come down with it. Making him sound like Odell Beckham. Really? <laughs> I mean, the the guy really is the talk of the spring right now. It's just whatever. You can't get an interview without somebody mentioning his name. Spring game next Saturday, the 18th, at LT Smith Stadium. And we will have a ton of spring game coverage for you here on the Red Zone next week, I'm sure, previewing all assets and, and maybe even a little bit of what to watch for in a spring game. The squad versus squad, still a couple months away from the season starting. We'll cover all the bases for you next week right here on the Red Zone. We'll take a quick break a little bit early here. We usually take it around 7.30, but a lot more content to get to, and we can't wait to do it, but we do have to step aside. We'll talk baseball. Hilltoppers played an interesting game in many assets last night at Bowling Green Ballpark, and we'll preview a big series coming up here on the Hill against Southern Miss. You're listening to the Red Zone right here on Revolution 91.7. Keeping you up to date on Western Kentucky sports, you're in the Red Zone right here on Revolution 91.7. Welcome back to the Red Zone here on Revolution 91.7. Fletcher Keel, Billy Rutledge, William Puckett have been talking some WKU basketball, some spring football. If you missed it, we hope to have the show online uh, soon for you. We'll put an audio feed on YouTube. If you have a question, a comment, you missed something that we said, you want some clarification on something we said, send us a question on Twitter, at WKU Red Zone. And Ms. Rutledge, it, it appears we have a question yep. right in front of you. You want to read that for us so we, we can do. Uh, answer it. it? And it says, with the team coming on strong at the end of both of the last two years, talking about the WKU football team, you think? do you think that we can string it together all season and win 10 games next year? That's from sh- at Shimmy812. I think I, ten, 10 wins is 10, realistic t- right now with this offense. With now the defense has a lot of work. 10 to wins do. was realistic with last year's offense. Right, but at the same time, you know, the the defense was what? The worst ever in a Hilltopper it was, uniform. It was bad. Worst FBS defense, I believe. It's like 121 out of 129. Yeah, I think what the not stat was. Not good. The see the I I would any other year, even last year, I would say yes, a 10 a 10 win team. Uh, is not out of the question this year. This is a tough schedule. Vanderbilt, which which I think the Hilltoppers win. can win. Let's go Indiana, down. which Let's I think the, the Hilltoppers yeah. can win. LSU, which is going to be a battle for uh, maybe a half, but LSU will, half. will pull that one out. And then what I believe is the is the most difficult conference USA schedule with Louisiana Tech and Marshall, the two division winners from last year, and MTSU all coming here to Fikes Field. Now that does give an edge to the Hilltoppers, but I think they lose one of those games, and they lose the LSU game, and something tells me they'll slip up again down the road. So I think nine and three is is a safe bet. Although again, a lot of defensive questions, uh, a lot of questions with health on the offensive side of things. Uh, it, it's just too tough of a schedule to to go ahead and, and call this a ten win team. It's I think. not like Smith Stadium is Death Valley. It's not like the best home court or home field advantage, which makes those three home games even tougher. Right, but the Hilltoppers are on the road most of the season. Seven yes. of the seven of the games are on the road. They only have f- compared to only five home games, and there's a stretch they play at Rice, and then they go to Middle Tennessee, and then they go at North Texas, at LSU, at Old Dominion. And you're yep. playing at Old Dominion after a very emotionally drained at LSU game. Yep. Let's say even if they remember do, how emotional this year's Old Dominion game was in their first FBS year. Right. And then you have to go play Florida Atlantic at FIU, and then ending the season at home against Marshall, where no one's going to be here. Right. That's the Friday after Thanksgiving, and that I hate how WKU gets stuck with that Friday after Thanksgiving. Game. A Marshall team. Who's going to have a new starting quarterback though? Who's still going to be in the top of Conference USA though? There's... Here's the thing that worry. I don't. I don't care about what Marshall does on the field. I'll worry about that come the week before Thanksgiving. They travel so well. They are one they of the do. best, if not the best, football fan base in Conference USA. And I'm. A, I w- do not doubt there's going to be more green. Oh, there's going to be a lot more after the a way. A whole lot more after ending their perfect season. It was the first it's loss. The making, wasn't it? yeah. It's the making of a great rivalry, that's for sure. I, nine and three is my is my prediction here. A, a few months out from the season, I don't see ten wins yet for this. I team. I can get on the nine and three bandwagon. I think if we sit here right now, I think they will lose to LSU. They will lose 
to I think, Rice. I think they'll the spread against LSU. And I think Cover they'll the lose to. What do you think the spread would be? Louisiana Tech, twenty-one or something. I don't know. Like I think ten wins is realistic. I, I know it's tough, and especially for Western. But you got to think what's coming back. You get the Brandon Dowdy the back. Brandon there. Dowdy, the Brandon Dowdy. And, and when I look at this, offense. when I look at this schedule, I know Conference USA is a lot more step up, and there were some tough games last year. I'm going to admit mm-hmm. that. Yep. But it's still Conference USA, and this offense is still higher class than Conference USA defense right now. And the defense for Western cannot possibly get worse than it was last time. I mean, I think I think whatever. Here's almost I have this thought in the back of my mind, is that we're gonna. I think I almost say that everybody's talking about this offense, and the defense is gonna be like, "Hey, where's our love?" So they're gonna come out their first game against Vanderbilt. They I I think they could only allow 14 points because Vanderbilt. Is terrible. I mean, they're worse. They're bad. They're worse all around than our defense. They might was, lose four than games. WKU's defense if, was. If Vanderbilt played a Sun Belt schedule, they would probably lose four games. They're terrible. Tough takes. IU, IU, is getting better. IU, but IU is, is a Big Ten team. They're IU gonna have is, some talent. I use a step below Illinois, who the Hilltoppers yes. almost beat last year at at Illinois, and they'll be going to IU. I think they can beat them in Bloomington. I just. I you can play some I mean, offense. I'm from I'm from Indiana, and I know I IU fans don't know what football is, kind of like Kentucky fans. But IU just doesn't have it. They just can't seem to get it right. They'll string together a few wins in a bad year last year in the Big Ten, mm-hmm. and they still they're thinking, "What are <laughs> this is football?" Yeah, I ju- I don't think IU has what it takes, especially with this high powered WKU offense and a defense who's going to have a chip on its shoulder because no one's talking about even that. at IU, even at IU, even in the because, cold September because they looked good. They looked good at Illinois, and that was a chilly game. I I went to that game yep. and wore shorts and a polo, and I was great because freezing. it was the, Marco it was the Polo beginning. wore a polo. Yeah, it was the Marco be- Polo did wear a polo. It was the beginning of fall. It hadn't hit Bowling Green yet, but we went and stepped out of the car after a long car ride, and it felt. Glorious out there in Champaign. But I think, and my geography is not perfect. I got to be in there though. <laughs> Bloomington, Bloomington is south of Champaign. I think okay. I think WKU can go in there and win by 14 plus. How about this? 14 talk, to, plus. talk to me about it after the Saturday, October 10th game against Middle Tennessee because <clears> the Hilltoppers will have played Louisiana Tech and MTSU at home. They'll also have hosted Miami, a MAC opponent, which is pretty equal with Conference USA until Conference USA beats them. Uh, to begin last year, so Conference USA for now has the and, edge in MAC and competition. And didn't Bowling Green State go on to play in the MAC championship? I think so. Yeah, and I, they're losing a lot of talent. That, though. They, they they had a lot. They had a big senior the, I class. Think that so again, talk to me after October 10th. That's the Hilltop as well played MTSU, Rice, Miami, Indiana, Louisiana Tech, Vander, and Vanderbilt by that point. So that's a good measuring bar. And then I could tell you if if I'll think that. Whatever they stand at, if they can get to 10 well, wins. You can't do that, Fletcher. The if question go, is right now. If they go undefeated through that stretch, I think it's not out of the question that they win 10 games by that point. So we will call you up after that stretch <laughs> and see what you think. Bring me in the studio. I'll still, I'll, I'll, I'll might still be here in Bowling Green. Please so. don't make us feel bad. We want to continue this and not guys, cry because you're going to be around. Guys, us. how about the schedule? How about we give a round of applause to Todd Stewart for this, a great schedule? Yeah. I'm talking va- at Vanderbilt, which, you know, they're not the best team gonna, right now, but that's still publicity. That's it's an SEC, SEC school. SEC school, an LSU. hour away from, right. an hour away from campus, so WKU fans who want to go see a huge win can travel down to that game. And they're doing a, they're doing a home and home with Vanderbilt. Yeah, and Vanderbilt is and coming. So, uh, and here. so I pray that they keep that game here and not do what they did against UK and take us back to Nashville at LP Field. Yeah. I don't want that. I want Vanderbilt to come well, to WKU. Part of that was UK is too big for their britches. And they refuse to play at Little Brother. But, <laughs> but that's fine. We'll, we'll, beat you, for, we'll beat you anywhere. Which is the a weird conversation. UK doesn't want to play us. I don't know why they're exactly. scared of us. But uh, how about the rest of the schedule? You got... Rivals against Middle Tennessee and Marshall. The end of that Marshall game, they had to schedule it again yep. for the last oh, game of the absolutely. season. absolutely. At LSU, which is going to be a national televised game. I it, mean, it'll be the it'll be the noon SEC Network game. I mean, at that it, time, but the very realistic opportunity that that's two undefeated teams going at it as well. It shows the FBS win did get something right. This the bowl real, win. The bowl win, right? Excuse me, but it did. Really helped Western and Brandon yep. Dowdy coming back, the hype coming around. 
This is as exciting a hilltopper football season that I've been a part now, of. Now, granted, the, the LSU year. game has been scheduled a couple years in advance, but it's it's working in the right direction to where at it, the right time at the right time went down there my freshman year and got up seven nothing nine nothing on the Tigers in a game that was like forty nine to nine. But LSU was talking afterwards about man. Western Kentucky came to play, and Alabama did the same thing a couple years ago as well. And I don't know what it is about the Hilltoppers across any sport, but when they play top-tier competition, they they go out and play. They don't bow down. You see basketball do it to, to Kansas, to Louisville. We saw football do it to Alabama uh, and LSU. And it, there's something special about playing for WKU, I think. And it's, it's not necessarily that Alabama week. Uh, I remember people, it wasn't, oh, we're going to beat Alabama, blah, blah, blah. On campus, it was... All right, Hilltop is going to play Alabama. It wasn't, oh, gosh, it's going to be a 100-point deficit. Yeah, let's see how they do. USA Today even ran a piece on it about the confidence and the swagger that Willie Taggart had. And Jeff Brom has just as much, especially with this offense. I don't know if it's as much, I mean, I don't know if it's as much an argument as, is this a WKU thing? As much as it is a mid-major thing. I mean, these, the, I mean, the majority of the players on WKU's team and across Conference USA and even in the Sun Belt is four or five of these players were maybe getting offers from mm-hmm. I want the big time schools. The big time schools, probably not even the biggest time of the big time schools. Maybe they were getting some offers from the lower tier, maybe UK, mm-hmm. maybe the Tennessee back when they were not so hot or not trending upwards. Yep. But these players, they want to go into places like Tuscaloosa and Baton Rouge and when they went down to Knoxville two years ago. And they want to go, you know what? You didn't look at us, so we're going to show you a reason to look at us. Yep. They didn't do it against Tennessee, but they did it against LSU and they did it against Alabama, only losing 35 to nothing. And 21 that, of those points coming in the first quarter. And Alabama saying, you, this is a like this is the best team and the best defense we may face all year. They just mm-hmm. couldn't get past our defense. Yeah. Hearing but I think, Nick Saban speak that highly of the Hilltoppers, mm-hmm. it, I'm an Auburn fan before I came here and still wearing an Auburn shirt right now. I am wearing an Auburn I shirt. Bought, I got him that, that shirt. That Will got for my birthday this past oh, year. That's cute, guys. It, I know. And so so that that Iron Bowl rivalry runs deep. But hearing Nick Saban say that about the Hilltoppers made me smile a little bit, saying, "That's right. You, you know what just hit you." You may have won 35 nothing, but you know what just hit you with the Hilltoppers' defense. For a lack of a better word, I want to use the word swagger. I think Western always yep. comes in and has a little bit of swagger, and I think that's just a part of the program. The basketball is such a historic program, but it's kind of viewed as a mid-major right now. But I still think that you play for Western Kentucky, you play at Diddle Arena, there's a little mm-hmm. special magic yep. there. You play with a little bit of swagger. You put on, you got the towel, everybody's waving the towel yep. around. I mean, the atmosphere for sports around Western is very good right now. When, when people are there. When and they're that, there. That's a different conversation. Diddle Arena, Fikes Field, Nick Dennis Field, special places to play. Hilltoppers will play at Nick Dennis Field this weekend, take on USM. But last night they played... Uh, a bit of a different game at Bowling Green Paul Park for the second time. Played against the Crosstown, uh, officially now rivals, I guess. Bowling uh, Green Hot Rods. Bowling Green. The Battle of Bowling Green, the single-A affiliate of the Tampa Bay Rays, the Hot Rods. What was only a three-and-a-half inning game because the, the storms came in. So enough baseballs played to get a run. But, man, it was a one nothing Bowling Green win, technically, even though the game wasn't official, nor does it count on either record. But I'll tell you what. Going into the game, someone might think, oh, man, the Hilltoppers only lost by one to a professional team. The average age of the Hot Rods is, is about 20. Well, Anderson Miller just, just should like be the playing above the Hot yeah, Rods right now. Yeah, Anderson Miller projected to go no later than the fifth round of the MLB draft. Had two hits off of minor league pitching and some hard hit balls. With Dietrich, some scouts in the stands. Yeah. Thrown out at home. Yeah, he was thrown yeah. out at home from a right fielder. Not sure why he went. Didn't think he had a good enough jump on that ball. So it was almost a one-to-one game. But, man, let me tell you, Philip Dietrich has some power. Those wooden bats that they used last night, he had the hardest hit ball of the night, and he just smoked it into the dirt down the first base line for an easy ground out. But in batting practice, he was sending him over the scoreboard and right field. And it was really just a special thing to be at and be a part of and something that I'll remember for a while. And I hope the Hot Rods and Hilltop can continue this for years to yeah, come it's and pretty, play a full game maybe once in a while. It's pretty cool. I don't know if there's a lot of minor league teams that actually do that. There are a couple. I know uh, the Lansing Lugnuts, who are also in the Hot Rods League, do it what with a Michigan name. State. The Lugnuts. Yeah, the Lugnuts. It's a good one. Uh, they do it with Michigan State before their season starts, so it, it happens, but it's not very frequent. I think it's pretty cool, especially for Western. You know, you said it's with Michigan State. Michigan State's you know a bigger school. Western is you know doing that and. 
Western baseball has usually been around 500. That's usually what they come out. That's the past kind of few the, years, yeah. That's kind of the Myers way right now is you win a few games, you, you lose about the same. <laughs> so I think it was a really cool experience. They got to use wooden bats, and, I mean, mm-hmm. it's, I, I think it's something that – Fans would could be excited about. I think so. It'd be something that if it doesn't pour and get rain delayed, I yeah. feel a few more people will go out I, next time. I think it was. I think it was kind of a tale of two. Uh, a tale somewhat, of two halves. Yes, a tale of two halves. Speaking not In obviously like the game, game. <laughs> but I think I think is that the players were excited to prove what they had. Yep. I mean, all these. W, there was obviously going to be major league scouts there mm-hmm. for not only because it's the Rays affiliate, but because hey. They're coming to a major a major league ballpark. Anderson Miller. And you have Anderson Miller. I think Ryan Church can get some looks at. I'm yep. not going to start naming players on WKU's team who I think they can get looks at. But also, Ryan Thurston. But also, it was kind of a game where you're like, it was on. It's like they were kids again. They yeah. get they get brand new bats when they get to the stadium. They get to show off, play with their new toys. And I think it's like, <laughs> hey, let's show what we have. But hey, this is going to be fun. It doesn't count against mm-hmm. our record. Doesn't count for our record. Let's just go out here, hit some baseballs, and have some fun with guys who are our same age. And they faced. They played. They played two players who they played against last season yep. in a person from ULL and a person Jace, from Louisville. Jace Conrad from ULL last year who actually grounded out to record the only RBI last night for the Hot Rods. And I can't think of the Louisville's pitcher name, but he was a part of the only team, ULL Birdie? or UK, to beat no. uh, WKU at Bowling Green Ballpark in that game last year. So pretty cool. 11-1 and one WKU is when they play at Bowling Green Let's Ballpark. all just have some fun, guys. Let's all just How, use think, some wooden think of bats this. and have fun. Anderson Miller, a high, highly touted prospect. Just think of this: he gets drafted by the Rays in the fourth round. Oh, don't and, do that. And to next me. summer, or next beginning of the summer, when we see the Hot Rods and Hilltopper scrimmage again, leading off for the Hot Rods against Josh Bartley is going to be Anderson Miller. You think Anderson Miller? How great would that be? I think he'd be in Double A. I don't. I don't think that'd be great. That'd be a great story though. A. Yeah, I agree with Will. I don't, I don't think they. I don't think Miller's got some pretty good talent. You said fourth round. I mean, I'd I'd give it third round, third or second round. Went four for five with two RBI, scored three runs on Saturday alone to help the Hilltoppers sweep a doubleheader after losing twenty to one on Friday. Wow. Won fifteen to six and three to one to take the series from Louisiana Tech, or from Louisiana Louisiana Tech has Southern Mississippi coming into the Nick this weekend and will be facing quite the pitcher in James McMahon, two time Conference USA pitcher of the week, was the pitcher of the week nationally last year. And through 11 shutout innings combined against the 14th ranked Rice and 29th ranked Mississippi State, and leads the Conference USA in ERA. So no tall task there. Would think he's going to throw Friday. That's usually when the ace goes. And so Hilltoppers, they win series. That's what they do. Only have lost, I believe, that one UAB series in conference play. Are sitting at a 500 record in Conference USA right now. But go out this weekend if you can to catch some Hilltopper baseball. Uh, they scrimmage today because they get, didn't get in as many arms and at bats as they wanted to last night with the rainout. And yeah, baseball season's here, boys. Hey, hey, a little shout out to Miranda Kramer on the WKU softball. Fifteen team. strikeouts you, today and a five-one win. Yeah, how many uh, Conference USA Pitcher of the Week things have she won? Four in and a she row. She got I drafted think. six. In six that overall pitch. to the Philadelphia Rebellion, <laughs> Pennsylvania Rebellion, and the. Things are going well for her. You yeah, WKU to... fans need to head out to the softball field let's, and let's, see her pitch. Let's hope uh, softball gets reinstated in the Olympics. How cool would that be to see a second Olympic hilltopper in Miranda Kramer representing USA? I think that's the kind of the goal in softball is kind of play for your national team. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know if Fats pitch is the most popular thing, and mm-hmm. I'm not sure if it, you know, maybe the best paying, but I really think that that's kind of the softball's main goal is the national team. And if it, it does come back to the Olympics and even the off chance that she actually makes it that far, I mean, that's that'd pretty be, cool to think. Hilltoppers, really cool. Hilltopper, Hilltopper Nation Olympics. went crazy for Claire Donahue. Just think of what they'll do for someone like Miranda Kramer. We're going to take our final break, and when we come back, the moment you've all been waiting for, we get to talk about how Kentucky lost against Wisconsin, recap the final four in the tournament, and maybe throw Billy a bone with some Masters talk. You're listening to The Red Zone right here on Revolution 91.7. Talking all things Tapper Sports, you're listening to Red Zone on Revolution 91.7. 
uh, emergency, so to speak, his accident, and glad Claps to see him back long. in the studio here. Yeah, the Claps Lung scare. I remember when Josh told me that. Scared me. Yeah, it scared me too. He, uh, Kyle, so 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 thoughtful of the show. He actually texted Josh saying, "Hey, man, not gonna be able to make the not show make it. Uh, about a month ago. <laughs> I'm in the hospital with a collapsed lung, so always putting the show ahead. Thanks for that, Kyle. Working the boards tonight, doing a great job. And a sad time for Kentuckians." Not not me necessarily, although I'm not a Kentuckian, so I can get away with it. The basketball season has come to an end. A new champion, the Duke Blue Devils. UK's in there, but not the UK that people thought would be winning the title as Kentucky lost just a thrilling game to Wisconsin. And really, two of the three games in the Final Four this weekend were really good. It awesome. went, went down the wire, and it, it wound up that it was a blue and white team with UK in their name, Duke winning it all. It, and it's it's funny. My favorite part about the tournament is seeing the eight seeds, seeing the five seeds make it. We saw three one seeds make the final four this year. In a seven, right? Michigan in, State. In a seven, uh, seven yeah, or eight. Seven. seven. Because they followed. They, Michigan State followed the exact same path, path that UConn, UConn did, UConn did last, last year. year. And the only they didn't win the national and, championship. And usually I would be mad about that many one seeds, but this year I was okay with it. It seemed like this was a year. That I don't think it's going to happen again next year, maybe the next five years, but this was a year where it was truly the top teams in college basketball were the top teams in college basketball. It was fun to watch. How about that Wisconsin team? You know, you know, breaks my heart seeing them lose, yeah. especially to Duke, but uh, <laughs> Frank Kaminsky and Decker, you know how tired he was in the national championship game? He was throwing up air balls at one point because yep. he was just giving everything he had. And that's what I love about basketball is when the emotion is shown like that on the biggest stage. And it was just that Wisconsin team was so fun to watch. That Duke team, that run they put in the national championship game was – Insane. It yep. looked like Wisconsin was going to win the game. They were it up did. by nine. And Frank the Tank was doing his thing. I mean, it was just an. It's why March is one of my favorite sports months. It, no, it's not March anymore. Cause just the madness in the April. April's pretty good. The Masters coming up. We're still talking about that before the show goes off. But it's just the the March Madness and NCAA tournament is just one of the best sporting events there is. This. Wisconsin team, like Billy said, was amazing to watch. They were so much fun. They could shoot the lights out while getting the ball down to Frank down low. And you, who, I mean, rarely do you see a seven footer who's American. Oh, yeah, the moves. You can shoot <laughs> yeah. the ball from beyond That's the arc. That's a good point. An yeah. American seven footer. But that, Christian Lehner. That being said, the one thing I, everybody was asking me, Will, who do you think is going to win the national championship? And I go, my heart wants Wisconsin who's to win. Who's going to win, but Will? I think Duke's going to win. And the reason why I said that was because when I was watching after Wisconsin beat UK, it seemed like that was their pinnacle. Yep. It seems like that was their national championship Wouldn't that be game. your pinnacle, too, though? It, it's kind yeah, of the look of I the mean, draw. Being on that side of the bracket, it's kind of the kind of a, a crappy draw. But if you truly think that UK was not the team that all UK fans thought they were, you'd be like, we're a good enough team, we beat them, but hey, I want that next team in the national well, championship Well, game. Wisconsin's a little different because of the history with last year's Final Four yeah, and, and how they had to play them to get to the championship game and then the, the Harrison buzzer beater. Very cool, But uh, by the way. That's what everybody said is that they came into this tournament was like, we want Kentucky, we want Kentucky. Well, that's great if they're on the other side of the bracket. But if they're on the same side of the bracket as you and that's your goal is to beat one team, how are you supposed to get hyped up for your next game? And I know everybody's like, it's a national championship game, it's a national championship game. But if your one main goal going into the tournament is to beat a team and they're not on the opposite side of the bracket that you are, what's the point? How about the emotional drainage that Wisconsin had to go through during those two days? I mean, you're playing the entire tournament, which is draining enough, but then to beat an undefeated Kentucky team that beat you last year in the in the tournament, and, and then to go and have that lead in the national championship mm-hmm. game and all the attention that these guys are getting. I mean, Wisconsin's a very very popular, very big school, but you know you, you don't I mean, normally don't, you don't normally think Wisconsin and when, a basketball you, when you're thinking your basketball yeah. powerhouse preseason rankings. So, I mean, just really a, a very emotional day for the Wisconsin Badgers. I mean, that, I, that's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, didn't mean to interrupt you, but when I think of Wisconsin, I don't think of basketball at all. Yeah. I mean, they've had the past three, four seasons, they've cheese. been good. I, when you say Wisconsin, I think cheese. Do they have a cheese major? Hey, we should look that up. We should, we should, we should look no, that up. We'll have it for you next week. Major. Like a cheese, like a curding major, maybe? They would have, like, cheese heads, like so, the, the hat. So, Mir, or Mard and the, the two, three, or two of the three really good games – was really one call each game, but a, a body of work by the officials 
Most people said he wasn't touched good. it. He touched that ball was out of bounds. I don't the know how you don't that ball went off a dude. And the shot clock violation that wasn't called to to give Wisconsin the putback to that ultimately gave them the lead, and UK would never recover. You from give that. a little the two calls that kind of overshadowed the final four. You give a little, you get a little. <laughs> Kentucky fans, Kentucky fans, do not tell me that that was not a flagrant one on Lyles. Yeah, I don't that know how was that f- wasn't any sort of. That was a flagrant one. You technically, can't, you can't come back. By and definition, hit him. I believe the ball was still in play then, and by definition, it would have actually been a flagrant two because it wouldn't have been a dead ball. So and Lyles I mean, would have been out. And so they got away with that, and then that the shot clock had had expired. There's no, but I mean, karma. Will is yeah, that what you're trying exactly. to say? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, God giveth and God taketh away, and that's exactly what he did to UK fans. Saw a lot but, of yeah. Saw a lot of UK fans t- saying karma back to Wisconsin when that that tip ball on the baseline was it all wasn't overturned. Out. And here's the thing with replay is yes, it, it's awesome to have, and yes, it it can slow down the game at key moments. But it's only worth it if you get the call right. Right. How do they not have the ability to see the same thing that we're looking at? Yeah, I've heard that they, they didn't have that they, replay yeah. available, which makes no sense because Malarkey. all the entire rest of the nation watching that game had the replay available, but the three most important people <laughs> crucial in that game to make the call didn't. And that's just well. when, <laughs> when you review, when, I mean, I want to know this. When you when they review the plays, do they get the broadcast angle or they're like specific? No. I don't know. They might because, just get the stadium angle. Then that's crap. For Ooh. lack of complete better term, they should get the broadcast angle because there were a couple angles you were like, all right, he didn't hit the ball. But then that one specific angle that I know we have all seen a thousand times on Twitter, maybe yep. Instagram, maybe uh, Instagram. Snapchat. Vine, maybe. I don't know. Yes. He, Vine it. That, Choose your social media. I mean, media. his finger bent. Like, his finger bent. I don't think they can zoom. I think they have the camera angle. I, I, I don't think they can zoom a then million should... times. Like, we, it took five minutes for, you know, whoever it was to get into that and see that finger bounce. And I think that's a lot about the officiating, though. Like, that's kind of part of still the officiating. It's a big topic in baseball is mm-hmm. kind of the umps and decisions. Consistency, and, yeah. yeah. But I do also think that now that we're transitioning into this technology age where we can know exactly what happened – I still kind of like the, the human element, I, and I know Kentucky fans are mad, but it still turns out the way that it does, and, and still it was the Final Four. It wasn't – Fletcher used the word overshadowing of the Final Four. I wouldn't say that. I think it would be – it was a bad call, or maybe not the worst call. It was a call that you could see that clearly went the other way. But I, I think I kind of like still the human element, even though it was the bad call. I mean, I don't think it would overshadow it. I consider it's part of the game, and so I don't think it takes away from the game because you're still talking about the game. But I think if you're going to have replay, you should have every angle, whether it's a broadcast I angle agree. or the NFL, an angle from NFL and MLB have. But then They're putting it on the pylon now, like but, the goal line. Yeah, but then you go to the answer, well, that's professional, and, million. and this is college. But it's you know how much money the NCAA makes off March Madness alone? That's their, that's their breadwinner. And how much they pay their football. students? Yeah. The entire bowl season combined. I, I just, I mean, you like you said, Fletcher, if you're going to have replay, you have it so you can get the call right. And I'm twice they didn't get it right. I'm with Bill. I'm okay with the human element of things if replay is not involved. You have to pick so, one. Yeah, either have replay and, and do everything you can to get the call right or don't have it and we can, of all the crazy technology we have, we could still feel like we're in the 40s and 50s and just let the officials do their job. You, you can't have a, a combination of the two, which is what we saw a couple times this weekend. From one great tournament, the Final Four is over, and one ending to a season to another, the Masters. Yes. Not really a tournament, but it is the official beginning to the PGA year, and Billy's wearing a Masters hat. He's, he's excited. Every year I say, all right, this is the year I'm going to watch golf, and then I watch maybe one hole of the Masters, and that's all the golf I watch. Tiger Woods finally back in in the Masters. I saw an interesting question on ESPN today. Is he becoming likable now that he's not winning? A little anymore? bit. It's like I saw him. He was bumping music on the course. You're not usually allowed to do that, but I don't think they're going to tell Tiger to put the earphones. He actually away. got kicked off of the or kicked out of the par three tournament today because he let disqualified because he let his daughter tap in a putt for him. I didn't hear that. Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I saw it on I saw it on ESPN and I was like, would Tiger get disqualified for? And then it's like he let his daughter tap in the putt and I was like, oh. Tiger? Well, PG, look, the PGA is becoming the NCAA in terms of violations. His I don't girl, like that. His girlfriend, Lindsey Vaughn, very popular Olympic athlete. He's kind my, of one of my to favorites. Get, right. He's trying to kind of get the public image back, and he had his kids there letting him mm-hmm. put it in. He's trying to get his likability back, and I think it all boils down to how he plays. It, 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 they said that he had a practice round, and he shot two over, which is pretty good in the Masters. you got to do a little bit better than that. 
But I think if he can start winning again, he can start trying to win the minds back of some of the people that used to like him before his incident. I think this is exactly what Nike wants. I mean, I, looking at this as a marketing, you have Rory who's tearing, who's roaring through this. Oh, puns. And you have Tiger who's, who's just kind of got to quiet me out. Like, Tiger's yeah. always going to be Tiger, but I want to I want I want to see Tiger win again. I mean, I just want to see that. I was I was never into golf when he was tearing up, but now I'm starting my allegiance is kind of going to Rory, but I'm like Tiger, give me something. Have you ever seen Tiger when he was at his peak? Have you ever gone back oh, and f- seen course. what he was able to do? He was winning tournaments and majors by double digit strokes. It was insane he, how good the man he was. He was phenomenal. And I mean, I even if he doesn't beat Nicholas's Matt or majors record you're Four still more to go. you're still thinking tigers i mean you can almost make the argument that tiger is up like competing with it's almost Nicholas, the, it's almost the it. michael jordan lebron james comparison is which is really better than the other maybe they're just two the two best to ever play in their own right each one day when we have the technology to go back in time i want to go back in time where i can pick up tiger at his best and take him back to nicholas at his best and just head to head golf off and let's see what they do. That'd PGA Tour 15, Will? Yes. <laughs> do you want to play some Xbox? Of after? course. For, I'm down. So for the first time in, in a while that Tiger Woods is actually playing in a master, he isn't seen as the favorite. So we'll leave you on on a, a couple of words from each of us. Who are you going to take? You're going to take Bubba, Lefty, Rory, the field. We'll start with the golfer or the golf uh, <laughs> maniac in the room with Mr. Billy Rutledge. Well, Bubba who, announced, who are you going to take? Bubba announced earlier this week he wasn't going to Waffle House after – if he won the Masters again, so I can't pick Bubba now. But I don't know, Rory. It's not his tournament. He's already collapsed before in the Masters. If you want me to put out one game, Spieth, Jordan Spieth, Jordan he's on Spieth. fire. I'm a roll with Rory. I think Tiger's going to be in the top 15, but I'm taking there Rory. The only major he hasn't won yet. Write I'm it taking down, Rory. Write it down. I I just want to see another another great finish. The really one Masters I ever watched was. The 2012 one, I believe, and that was the one where Bubba and I forgot the other guy's name, but they Cabrera? went. I, I believe so. Where they went into the extra hole, oh, the yeah. overtime of golf, and they went the playoff Playoffs. playoff hole, and he hit that shot from the woods and the go dogs in the background. And I'm no Georgia fan, but from Georgia, love it. So I want to I want to see Bubba win it again because I like him a whole lot. And that's going to do it for us here on Revolution 91.7 on the Red Zone. Thanks for spending your Wednesday night with us. Same time, same place, next Wednesday for Will Puckett, Mr. Billy Rutledge, Kyle Newman, I'm Fletcher Keel saying so long. Next Wednesday at 7, the Red Zone on Revolution 91.7.